Hey everyone, uh, this is Mark Fernandes calling in on Zoom uh, from Stonemass Village, Colorado. I'd like to welcome in today, Eric DeRosa. Eric, how are you today? Hi, Mark, I'm great, how are you? Doing well, Eric. I am here today to introduce our new podcast. Eric DeRosa and myself are gonna be hosting this new mental health podcast called From Survivor to Thriver. And our goal here is to uh, kind of share our story and hopefully a lot of other people's stories and how they've dealt with mental illness and uh, moved on from suffering and surviving and moved into thriving. And uh, we're hoping to welcome a lot of people in and uh, Eric and I will be co-hosting this, but today is our first episode. Uh, Eric's actually gonna be the subject. I'm gonna be interviewing him today. So Eric, if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your bio, age, marriage status, work stuff, whatever you wanna share. Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh... Welcome everybody. Really excited to be co-hosting this with Mark. Uh, I'm 49 years old. Uh, grew up for uh, all of our friends listening back on the East Coast in Somerset, Massachusetts, um, across the river from Mark, <laughs> who grew up in Fall River. Uh, spent first 18 years of my life there and then went to school in Boston. Uh, graduate of Brandeis University. Uh, oddly enough, Mark is uh, a BU grad, so a lot in common. Um, met my girlfriend, now wife, uh, Amy at Brandeis, and we moved to New York in 1993. Uh, spent 18 years uh, on and off Wall Street in the financial world uh, in New York. Uh, went to get my MBA at uh, NYU and from there, we left in 2011 uh, for reasons we'll obviously be talking about as, as these podcasts take hold. And um, I live uh, right across the creek, as we like to say, uh, from Mark here in Snowmass Village. Uh, so we've been here since uh, October 2011. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. So one of the main goals we have here, um, and I say we because Eric enlisted me, but a lot of this fell out of his brain. I have to give him a lot of credit, is to look at mental illness in a way and try to remove the stigma. And, and, you know, there are all these places where cancer survivors or people who've suffered with different kinds of diseases go and, and they can share stories and, and find ways that people have been able to find treatment and take care of themselves. And um, Eric and I have been very passionate about sharing our own stories, having struggled with mental illness and especially living in a place um, where the outdoor industry takes precedence a bunch of us are endorphin junkies, and unfortunately, um, we have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, it's become to the forefront for us, and we really want to help other people. So that's why we're doing this. So Eric is here to share his story today. I'm going to ask him a series of questions, have a conversation, and hopefully share um, some things that will help others realize that they're either going through the same thing or similar things, and um, hopefully be able to inspire them uh, to find ways uh, to live better, to thrive while suffering from mental illness. Yep, and I love that word, uh, inspire. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was actually starting to think about this back uh, when I guess COVID first hit back in March and, you know, we spent a lot of time with our quote unquote pod, uh, you know, skinning, um, uphilling every day here at Snowmass. I started thinking about, you know, the kind of the three I words, the inspire, um, and, and the impact being, I think, the two big ones. Um, and that's a lot what I want to hopefully have come across in our podcast with people. And of course, my own story um, is to be an inspirational voice for other people out there. Well, let's get into it. Yeah. All right. If we're we're going to start right at the beginning. You know, so when did you, Eric, know or how did you know that you weren't mm -hmm. OK, that things didn't seem the same for you as other people? Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, when I think about, and I write about this as well, when I think about the word, you know, what, what does it really mean when society puts the, la the label okay on us, right? Um, and I think we really internalize that word okay, because we, we think and we expect um, a certain something, right? And we, we want people in society to see us in a certain way. Um, if I could really think back, uh, if, if I had the capability, um, I'd have to say, Probably in the womb, I realized it, but um, <laughs> but 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 obviously, um, you know, without being able to uh, to go back that far, you know, I would have to say it was probably in my early teenage years um, when I realized that you know I wasn't feeling um, and I wasn't existing the same way that other people were. Um, I felt anxious all the time, a lot of 
what I would call kind of physical manifestations and physical symptoms, headaches, um, I shake a lot. Um, I find it very difficult to be around people. Um, I remember even before that, when I was in grade school, um, I'd have difficulty falling asleep, going to sleep. Um, that continued on uh, to the point where I actually used to obsess, believe it or not, throughout the day. So I'd be in school and all day I'd be obsessing about the fact that I wasn't going to be able to sleep that night. Um, and so I used to, uh, and this is probably where I, I got my love for um, you know, watching baseball and listening to baseball, I would actually fall asleep every night with my old little transistor radio next to me, uh, listening to uh, the Boston Red Sox. And, and so that was kind of the first real manifestation for me uh, of what I would call kind of the OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder for, for those of you out there who might be new to it, um, and the anxiety loop where it was just a constant thought of something that I wasn't going to be able to do. And it was all encompassing for me. Um, and then that cycle would start, um, the next day and, and it would just continue, continue, continue. Um, so Eric, mm -hmm. you were, so we're talking training age years. You're very conscious that yeah. this is going on. When did you yeah. begin to realize that it was actually inhibiting you or getting in your way in life? Uh, I think, you know, in high school, a bit. Um, and I think I realized it was getting in my way because I was trying to always put up a facade. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in high school, um, not only studying and doing homework and trying to be, you know, top of the class student um, and also, you know, a, a student athlete, but I spent lots and lots and lots of time trying to hide the real me from other people. Um, and when I was thinking back over the last week about kind of what that high school time was like for me, um, for my, for those of you who are tuning in back from my high school days, um, you know, I, I transitioned from playing baseball to, to track and field, uh, which, um, as Mark, you probably know, uh, was not a choice of my own. Um, and, and so I was doing something for quite a long time, which I excelled at. Um, but that I wasn't very happy with. Um, and it allowed me to put up a facade to the point where I became kind of this arrogant, um, cocky figure, if you will. Um, ended up with the nickname Ego Man in high school uh, from some close friends. Uh, and while that kind of hurt me deeply uh, to a point which obviously I never shared with anybody, it was, it was actually kind of a, a character that I could go into um, when I was outside of the classroom and I was on the track um, because it helped me, even if it was for a couple or, of hours a day, it helped me to escape from uh, that person who I really was. And I would say, as I moved into college, um, that's when I really started to notice, you know, it was my first time living away from home uh, growing up in, you know, small town like you, Portuguese family, uh, you know, obviously a kind of a small, somewhat close knit unit, small number of friends. I was off to school for the first time. Uh, and I just found it, uh, especially in my first couple of years, extremely difficult, uh, to be able to, to function some, sometimes even just to get out of bed and go to class. Um, and, um, you know, it would, it would take all of my effort sometimes just to leave my dorm room, um, to go to, uh, to go to a class in the morning, if I even made it that far sometimes. If you made it. Well, the thing yeah. here, you speak about that, Eric, the thing that it sounds like to me is you really began to realize in college that this was a situation, but looking at yes. it in hindsight, you can see threads of what showed up in college and high school and earlier. Is that would you say oh, that's absolutely. Accurate? No, that's totally accurate. And, you know, as I've, you know, as I've gone through, um, you know, talk therapy, psychotherapy um, over the last you know, decade and a half, and we've started to look at and unravel uh, the different threads. And as, as my therapist in New York used to like to say, it's very much like peeling an onion back. You know, you kind of start with the outer layers and it's very superficial. And as you really get 
deep down into the, the core and the center of the onion, you start to discover, you know, um, what's really at the center of it. And so, yeah, as I look back now, um, and even look, you know, I talk about um, the tagline, you know, it's perfectly okay to not always be okay, right? So I don't have perfect days every day. I don't think any of us do. Um, but I do sometimes now have the ability to look back and see those threads and say, yeah, that was that from 30 years ago is why I'm feeling like I am today. So I want to dig in a little bit deeper. You brought up yeah. uh, you used the word facade and then uh-huh. you even had a nickname for said facade. His name was Eagle <laughs> Man, um, yeah. which I think is great. <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can talk about Eagle Man in the third person. Like it's not really you, um, yeah. but I want to dig in a little bit on this. So like, how long do you feel like, or does that facade still show up sometimes? And how much energy does it consume to kind of like use that alter ego to cover up what's really going on? So, you know, if I think about the two place, the two times in life really, where I think the facade was um, really evident. First, first was in high school and, and, you know, just to be, you know, totally open and honest, which I think is the whole point of like what we're doing with this podcast. Um, you know, other than I think to my wife, to Amy, I don't think anybody's actually heard me disclose in public, you know, the nickname that I had um, in high school. So, um, so yeah, it did, you know, it did consume me. Um, it sort of became kind of who I was, I would say in my, my, especially in my last couple of years of high school. Um, it, it, allowed me to feel like I was still part of the cool club um, through my athletics and, you know, through being in certain classes. Um, And when it really started to manifest itself was when I moved to New York Uh, because I realized that the image that I needed to present to the world was the image of the pinstripe suit banker, really well put together. Um, not this person who was spiraling and unwinding and falling apart on the inside. And so I talk about with people, I feel as though throughout my career, um, up until I really started to address it, um, both through medication and through talk therapy, I feel as though I had two jobs. I feel like one job was my actual job of being a finance executive, traveling, being on the road, um, doing everything it is that somebody in the finance world does. I feel like my other job, which was also a full-time job, was hiding who I was from the rest of the world. Um, And it became almost as exhausting, if not more exhausting, than my real real work. Um, And it was it was kind of, and, and you, I know Mark having a theater background, it was almost as though um, I would be trying to come in and out of character at various points, not only in my life, but various points in the day. Um, I would come back to my office and I would think, oh gosh, did I portray who I wanted them to see? Um, or did I let it slip out? Did they actually see um, you know, what was going on in my head? Did, are they actually hearing those crazy repetitive thoughts um, that you and I have talked about before? Um, and, and ultimately it became um, when it was, it became when, not if at some point, it's when are they going to find me out? Um, it's almost like a kid uh, who's younger, who acts out uh, and does things um, in an effort to get caught. I kind of felt at some point um, the the game was, the gig was going to be up uh, and they were going to find me out. Um, They didn't, (laughs) which which I'm still surprised at to this point. So my question for you then is like, did you, if you weren't found out, and I put those air quotes in, um, (laughs) why, why, or, you know, what happened or what led to you to deciding it was time to open up or ask for help or that you realized that this was a, this was a problem that you should try to at least address. Sure. Uh, so obviously, you know, I had been, I had been suffering with anxiety. Um, I wouldn't say severe depression, but with with anxiety comes a depressive loop, um, and of course, 
significant, significant OCD. So, right, so that loop was playing and playing and playing and it, it became progressively worse through my college days and much, much worse um, as I moved into uh, New York. Um, and it was, I think for the first time, it was in 2004, um, Amy and I had been spending a long weekend up at her dad's house and we were, uh, we were driving back and we were on the New York State Thruway. And for those of you who are not familiar with the road from Albany to New York City, it's pretty straight. Uh, it's about 180 miles. And, um, and as we were driving on the Thruway that day, um, all of a sudden, I started to forget where I was. Uh, I didn't realize I was driving. Uh, I had been having a conversation with Amy that I don't remember. Uh, and at one point, I said to her, I need to pull over the car. Um, from that point on, I don't remember uh, getting back into the city, uh, which was still probably another hour and a half. Um, and that was probably that was uh, my first real dissociative episode, uh, where um, I, I liken it to um, doing a control alt reset on a computer, where my brain had just been so overwhelmed for such a long period of time, it needed that reset. Uh, and, and I felt better once I got into the city, uh, it was, as though no, kind of my circuits had been rewired. Um, but within a couple of days, I started to feel myself trend downward. And, uh, and so that's when, um, I really decided for the first time, uh, to speak to a therapist. Uh, I had, um, I had some really good sessions with him. Things were going well, like everything else, uh, I think we all try to be our own best therapist as well. And, and I thought things were going well. I, I was on a light dose of some medication and I thought, oh, you know, I'm feeling good. Let me see if I can handle this on my own. Um, and then in uh, the late summer of 2007 was when I really hit rock bottom. Um, I had a dissociative episode that lasted uh, for an entire three day weekend. Uh, to this day, I still don't remember um, when it started. I don't remember when it ended. Um, I don't remember what I said. Um, Amy and I don't really talk much about it um, because I'm, I'm kind of, I'm still, here we are, uh, you know, 13 years later, I'm still afraid to actually hear what, what may have transpired. Um, and it was at that point when I reached rock bottom and I was in crisis, um, I wasn't sleeping. Um, I, was, I was in a pool of sweat. Um, I, I just, you know, I got to a point where subconsciously I, I just said to myself, like, I, I, this can't happen anymore. I can't, I just can't go on. Um, and I, and, and I thought I, I had two choices. One of them I didn't want to think about. Um, the other was uh, somewhere, somehow uh, I managed with Amy's help uh, to get into a car. We drove into the city. Uh, we, she had contacted my therapist uh, and our former neighbor in, in New York uh, was a therapist as well. And we had all been in touch. Uh, and my therapist said, we need to get you on um, Clonopin, which is uh, an anti-anxiety medication, which uh, they use off-label. Um, it had been used for seizure, seizures. Uh, and so, and he said, I need to see you tomorrow, you're in crisis. Um, and I remember within probably 10 minutes of taking my first Clonopin, uh, I started to see the world clearly and my, my brain quieted down. Um, we drove back to Hoboken where we were living at the time. And uh, it was the first time we drove by a, a Boston market. Uh, uh, and it was the first time I actually was able to eat in three days. Um, we got home, I ate, I fell asleep. And from that point on, um, I committed myself to seeing my therapist regularly um, and here I am today living proof, um, that you can absolutely hit rock bottom. Um, it can happen more than once. There's, there's no, uh, there's no time frame on it. Um, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And like the podcast says, uh, you can go from being a survivor, um, someone who lives with mental illness, um, to being a thriver, somebody who actually takes ownership of it, makes a change, um, and could be sitting in front of you today, actually being able to tell that story. So Eric, obviously, you know, we know each other quite well personally, and I know your wife really well, and I know you couldn't hide it from her. So she knew, 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested for you though, who did you first tell that wasn't your wife or professional? Sure. Um, the first, I mean, the first time I can never remember talking openly about it uh, was with my mother. Um, it was during my high school years. Um, and I don't really think I ever talked about kind of my true feelings or what, I, what you know, what I was thinking because um, I was too scared to actually, you know, let that in, let that out into the open, uh, lest I be judged um, for, you know, I can't believe you'd be thinking something like that. Um, but I said, you know, I'm just, I'm not feeling right. I'm not sleeping. Um, I'm not sure if it's, you know, the thought of, you know, applying to college or college essays or, um, and so uh, my mom took me to, um, to see a therapist for just a couple of visits and uh, having gone through that um, and having um, had subsequent conversations with my mother back then, um, that mental illness um, is something that runs in the family. Uh, and so she was aware uh, and she, is, she, she had told me subsequently, she was aware that you know, there, there were some issues and, and she only wished that she would have acted on it sooner. Um, so that some of the signs were there from an earlier age. Um, and, you know, for all the, for all the, the faults and things I, you know, obviously I do, I do credit her for, um, you know, for some of that help early on um, to at least, you know, allow me to, start to bring to the forefront something that I thought was just very unique to me that only I was experiencing, but, but actually was something that um, affected more than just myself within my family. This is sort of related, Eric. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, and I feel like <laughs> this could have multiple layers to this answer, but I really want to kind of zero in to something um, on that emotional level of, you know, your mom brought you to a therapist, obviously, mm -hmm. when problems started to come to a head in 2004 and 2007, you reached out. But what do you think led to you kind of either overcoming the stigma or at least bringing you to the understanding that that you had a health problem and mm -hmm. you needed to reach out, pick up the phone, call a therapist, ask for help? What, how'd you get over that stigma that so many people feel? Well, you know, as you said, Obviously, Amy um, probably knows me, I would say at this point, better than anybody in the world. Uh, and so she was kind of the cheerleader behind me uh, and saying, you know, I really, I really think you need to speak with somebody. I really think you'll feel better um, being able to do that. And, and yeah, picking up the phone for that very first time admitting your vulnerability um, to somebody who you don't even know and you haven't even met yet um, takes a lot of courage. Uh, and I applaud everybody out there uh, who has done it or who will do it. Um, and that's really just the first step. I think the second step, which can be even more difficult is, um, is after you've picked up the phone and scheduled that appointment, um, it's walking in the door um, and kind of, I liken it to kind of ripping off a Band-Aid um, and, and really being vulnerable and transparent, again, with somebody uh, who you don't really know. Um, and yeah, being able to sit here today um, and doing this Zoom podcast and, um, and as being as open as I am with all my family and my friends and strangers who I meet, um, it's, it's not something that happened for me overnight. Uh, it, it definitely took some time. Um, but, but so going yeah. back there, Eric, yeah. who was there someone specific you were afraid, like you brought up earlier, like they're going to know, they're yeah. going to, do you hear these voices in my head? Can you hear them? <laughs> when, <laughs> yeah. when, like, what do you think kind of shifted where like, was there that fear of like being found out? Was there someone specific you were worried about finding you out? Yeah, I, for me, it was always um, because my career for me had really become center stage. You know, I, I kind of set up my life. Everything I did was very scripted. Um, you know, I studied hard in school. It was, you know, when I was, you know, performing, whether it was playing baseball when I was younger, track and field, you know, that was kind of all encompassing. And then when I went to school, uh, you know, 
obviously freshman year was a bit of a blur um, and, and didn't go as planned. But, you know, my subsequent three years, it was all about setting myself up for, you know, a successful career on Wall Street. And then I was able to land a career on Wall Street, you know, something that no one in my family had ever done. Um, and so as I, as I started to progress in my career, that was really my fear was somebody who I was working with finding out that Eric DeRosa, you know, is having all of these obsessive, crazy thoughts, panic attacks. Um, he's not the smiley figure that we see every day and everything we hear coming out of uh, his mouth um, here in the office uh, is something that maybe he just memorized so that he'd be able to say it and distract himself from thinking what was truly going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that, that was, that was it. So what, so what led to this switch? Like, what, like how has your life changed? Um, obviously for the better, here we are thriving, yeah. right? But how has your life changed since you chose to just become vulnerable to this transparent with the people you work with, you're close to, or even people you're meeting for the first time sometimes? I think the big thing for me is I feel like I'm actually, I feel like I'm living. Um, you know, I think the big, the big obviously transition for us came in, it started in 2010 when Amy and I were sitting around and starting to think about, you know, potential, you know, next steps. Uh, are we, you know, is New York going to be the place? Um, is this where we're always going to be? Um, I had the opportunity uh, at the company I was working at for the time to move to Latin America and run one of their finance divisions. Um, and it was at that time when skiing really became um, an integral part of my life. Um, and, you know, we started spending more and more time with my in-laws here uh, on vacation in Snowmass. Um, and it was at that point where the more time I spent on snow, the more, the more I felt like I was starting to live. Um, and the more I realized I wanted other people to know um, that it's okay um, to feel the way that you do. Um, and I think it was really when I started teaching skiing, uh, I know you and I have talked uh, as, as both of us, you know, have chosen that as our, our winter profession. But I, I feel like as I started opening up more on the snow uh, with my clients and learning more about my clients and, and, and helping them to, to share in uh, the love of the sport is when I started to really find my own voice uh, and feel comfortable talking about my own story. Um, so I really credit um, the time that I've spent out here in Colorado um, to giving me a chance to kind of recircuit and rethink who I am um, and feel free to, to share my story and, and hopefully be an influential voice. Um, we've talked about it. Uh, you know, I, I think if, if I were to really sum up um, why I wanna be so open about this besides just, you know, shattering that stigma of, yeah, mental illness is a thing. Um, and I don't want to, um, you know, desensitize people to it. Um, I want to normalize it. Um, but what I really want to do is I want other people, I want to help other people find their voice. Um, and whether that voice means um, speaking publicly about it, you know, that takes a lot of time and, um, and, and I would say for a lot of people, some courage, whether it means speaking to a friend for the first time, speaking to a family member, um, or even just looking in the mirror for the very first time and saying, hey, yeah, something isn't right. Um, you know, to me, it could be as, as small a step as that. Um, just recognizing um, and being able to, to say to yourself, you know, I may not be okay, and that's totally okay. Um, and that's the first step, I think, um, in moving to, um, you know, finding, you know, this survivor to thriver path. Well, and I think it's really important to focus on two things that you just said there, Eric, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but yep. you, know, you, you brought up the word normalize, right? And, yep. and, and I always use other physical injuries. It's probably because you and I spent so much time, you know, in athletic endeavors. And, mm -hmm. you know, if my ankle is sprained, 
you know, I don't hide it from anyone, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, Hey, can somebody help get me into my ski boot or yeah. hockey skate? This thing is swollen. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, Oh, you seem to be skiing a little funny today. Um, it is, is it more or less okay to be like my ankle hurts or be like, you know what? My head's just not in it, you know? And yeah, most people are not okay sharing my head's not in it versus like my ankle hurts. That seems much easier to share. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that is masculine. You know, there is, you know, people use the term toxic masculinity, but like normalizing that fact of like, you don't feel well, you like to use the term, you know, it's okay to not be okay or totally okay. Yep. And then the last piece about it that you brought up that I think is so important to focus on is not um, marginalizing or in any way, you know, you know, if you're demystifying something or normalizing it, but not like we don't all go through this the same way you know there yep. there's so much individuality to it and i think that's really important and um yep. it leads me to one more well, question that I well, really before you, yeah yeah before you bring up the question so i i think a couple of just quick follow-up points on that one i love the example of the sprained ankle and and i talk about um because i do have a couple of close friends who are type 1 diabetics right and um and it's no secret to my close friends and family and now it's no secret to anybody else out there i've been medicated for uh since 2004 um every day that's how i start my day uh and so i liken it to you know a type 1 diabetic right it's um it's an autoimmune disease uh and it's something that you live with and it's something that you manage on a day-to-day -day basis uh my friends have their insulin pumps um and there's no stigma around that for them and and for people like me and for people like you um you know we live with it every day and and we thrive with it um and so I really like that you brought that up. I think I think the other one, and I'm if I can, just a quick you know current day uh, example, and and this is part of the whole you know breaking the stigma um, and admitting that it's okay to not be okay. And I know some of our close friends and colleagues are probably going to come at me um, for even talking about this, um, but I want people to see that it's okay to talk about how you're feeling. Um, it's just an example of the, the 2021 ski season, right? You and I talk about it a lot. Like we moved here, we live here for, you know, November to April. Um, and we find ways to do other stuff to preoccupy our brains and our time when we're not on the snow. Um, but the 2021 ski season for me is anything but normal, right? Um, in a normal year, I've probably been on snow 40 days by now. Most of those teaching guests who I've been with for eight, nine, 10 years, um, having some amazing powder days. Uh, here we are, you know, sitting at the end of the year talking. I've skied 11 times, not even 11 full days. Um, I can count on my finger the number of runs where I've actually said, wow, that's been really fun. You know, the snow, yeah, it's okay. Um, is it great? No. <laughs> um, but that's I don't not have any but that that's not really matter. That doesn't matter. Uh, I don't have any clients coming out as of now, right? I'm not booked. I'm not teaching. Um, it's a completely and totally different year. And the other day I went out to ski. Um, I headed up, I'm not going to name the run, but you'll, you know, which one it is. I went up, uh, it's a run they've groomed every day here since I've lived here for, um, almost 10 years. I got to the top. It wasn't groomed. Um, I thought to myself, my God, the snow is awful. I don't want to be out here. I skied to the bottom of the mountain and I came home. And you know what? That's totally okay. You don't have to be okay every day out there. Um, and I bring this up because I know there are other people like us um, who may be having those same thoughts um, and may be having those same feelings. And it's okay to talk openly about it. There's no stigma around it. Well, and it's not even just skiing, right? Like we just went through a holiday exactly. season. Right? We just went through a holiday season where essentially if you decided to spend time with loved ones, you, you were, you were beginning super spreader events That's and, right. and the balance of like how you're managing your internal versus external life. Um, you know, and it was interesting when I heard you earlier talking about like keeping up that facade of ego yep. man, we're just going to call him ego man. Um, <laughs> I love that. And, I, and how I can that, see, I can see the shirts coming already. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we are looking for brand partnerships. So if anyone wants right. to get that shirt up, let's do it. Um, right. I think it's important, though, to 
broaden it, obviously you and I have connected and a lot of our really close friends have connected over skiing. But, you know, yeah. I think about a lot of the other people in my life who are struggling, whether it's the work-life balance, their family life, you know, people, you know, parents or single moms or dads at home trying to manage working from home and getting their kids in school. It's like, none of this is no. what we've perceived as okay or normal before, but no. it's okay and normal now. It doesn't mean you have to feel okay and normal about it, but that's the world we live in. That's right. And, 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 I, and I think to your point, um, I think what, what I've noticed uh, is everybody that I've talked to since March, whether it's a friend, uh, whether it's a, a tangential <laughs> acquaintance, whether it's a post I've seen on Facebook, um, you know, everybody has gone through something in 2020, right? It's, it's the year that keeps on giving in its own special way. Um, and so, yeah, but I think what's important and it's, it's important not only with what we're currently experiencing, but it's, it's important um, in our everyday life as, as we move forward is it's, it's fine and it's important to talk about it. Um, and, and when I say normalize it, I don't necessarily mean to suddenly make something like totally, totally acceptable all the time. And I think that's what I've seen also happen a lot with what's happening with the pandemic. People are actually trying to go to the other extreme and you see it on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. Um, and that's almost like the facade, right? Is people are trying to portray something that's so positive to make it, to make it seem like, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk about how I'm really feeling. So I'm just gonna pretend like everything is super great, right? Um, whether people are going on vacation or you know they're going out and they're taking 3000 photos in the backyard just to get the right light. So it makes them look really happy and cheery when they're struggling inside. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's all those different pieces. Um, but when being I think able the to important, talk about it. And I think the important part of that, Eric is, those exercises and things are wonderful if they're actually making you feel better and whole. Better, and, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, it's one of those things. You know, where and and it kind of leads uh, to this question that I really want to get to, which is, you know, if that's those things are helping you feel better, mm -hmm. you know, what are they? So, like for you personally, what are you doing yep. now? Continue. You know, you've talked about medication and talk therapy, but like yep. in your everyday life, what are you doing now mm -hmm. to continue to thrive and manage your mental illness? So I would say, you know, obviously the big one um, is, you know, moving out here and completely changing my career. Right. I went from a career that I thought I really wanted to do um, to actually a career which I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, whether it's coaching or mentoring um, or helping people create experiences on the snow, that's a big part of you know what I do. Um, and and in this year, uh, yeah, it's getting out there and it's it's skiing on the days right now where I actually feel like skiing. Um, it's going out yesterday with Amy and the day before on a big powder day um, and, and enjoying those turns. It's getting back into playing music. Uh, you know, one of the things I started doing when I was in New York, um, I, I really hadn't done anything musically growing up as a kid. And so I taught myself how to play uh, acoustic guitar, uh, not that great. Uh, but when I moved out here, I kind of put my guitars to the side uh, but as you know, you know, you picked yours up, I picked mine up and, and, and you and I have been playing, um, almost daily and, um, you know, I've been reconnecting with some, some other friends who are, uh, musicians. Um, and so that's one way of kind of keeping my, my brain active. Um, it's really fun. Uh, to me, there's nothing more fun than to watch your favorite musician play a song and, be able to download the the music tabs um, and then pick up the guitar and be able to play it and and for somebody to actually hear that um, and go oh wow <laughs> you can you can play that music um, you know in the summer um, you know I've been I mountain bike a ton um, I do some mountain bike coaching but you know for me there's nothing more fun than to get out with some of my close friends um, you know and and spend hours on end <laughs> as you know uh, you know climbing to the top of you know some of these amazing 
mountains here in Colorado on my bike um, and just looking out at the views and um, and just being thankful that I get to be around some really, really cool people doing some amazing things that, that I like to do. So for me, it's, I would say, you know, it's, it's really having found the outdoors um, and the outdoors have been a really great escape for me. Um, and, and being able to share the outdoors with, with other people, um, even my niece and nephew, when they came out here, uh, a couple years ago, um, just being able to show them, you know, there's, there's more out there, um, than just, uh, you know, kind of the, the summer, fall, winter, spring that you and I grew up knowing back, uh, in the Northeast. I just think it's so interesting. And, you know, obviously at some point I'll probably share my story. Uh, which is very different than yours. Um, you yep. know, there's obviously similarities regionally and some of the timings are quite yep. different. Um, but, you know, so many of us, you know, I can share quickly, I'm more on the depressive end um, and, and less on the anxiety end. But when my depression really starts to show up, the anxiety ramps up, right? So yep. um, I become anxious about being depressive, <laughs> I guess. Yes, exactly, <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> But one of the things that I find so interesting is so many of us have gravitated towards these sort of, for lack of a better term, like, like you know, suffer plus like, you know, enrichment exercise, whether it's <laughs> you know, right. get, getting on the bike, getting on the skis, like trying to learn a new skill. And, but it's also difficult, you know, a lot of people have been bringing this up and I think it's really important to mention is like, you know, if you made it through 2020, and, you know, you're not one of these people who's like, oh, my God, I spent 300 days on Duolingo and I learned how to play a guitar and I learned how to make bread. And it's like, yeah, that so sourdough bread specifically. Right. It has to be sourdough. like it takes a long time for it to rise, apparently. Yeah. But it, that's OK, too. Like if you made it, we are, you know, here we are. It's December 31st. I don't know when you guys are going to be listening to this, but <laughs> we are literally at the end of 2020, yeah. um, you know, and so much of it. And, you know, you and I have found these ways to cope, but I just want to put it out there that like, there's a million ways to do this. You know, like I, I, I can't express enough that, you know, what you're bringing up and the thought process um, behind your thoughts here and why I want to help you get this thing out there is yeah. this idea of moving from survivor to thriver is not a recipe. You know, it's, you know, it's as different as pancakes and bread and sourdough and, you know, a lot of the ingredients might be similar, but the way we mix them together for yep. each of our own is going to be very different. Yep. And, you know, interestingly enough, we, we, we talked about this um, earlier today um, and I'm just going to throw it out there, but I'm not going to disclose any locations. Uh, so, you know, you talk about sourdough, you talk about specifically doing stuff like, um, you know, I kind of discovered over the, you know, over the last few years, but, um, you know, especially I had the chance to, to travel very safely, um, tested, uh, you know, socially distanced and whatnot. Um, we were on an island uh, back in November, um, you know, and there's, there's this hidden like bohemian side of me, right? And so, you know, just kind of lying around on a nude beach. Um, yes, I'm throwing <laughs> that out there, right? Destigmatizing it, right? Um, but doing nothing. Like I was as happy as could be just kind of doing nothing, you know, swimming with the turtles, like for a couple of weeks time. Um, so it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be something very specific where you're tasking your brain or we're going out trying to perfect, um, you know, the perfect ski turn. Um, but it can be something as small as going out in the sun and taking a walk or, um, or listening to like your favorite music for an hour. Um, well, and it's think, really, yeah. I think it's really important Eric, to kind of boil this down because one of the things that I've realized is often when I'm struggling, whether it's with depression or anxiety starting to creep in, I actually don't notice it if I'm really busy, you know, and I know that about you, you're, you would al allow your career, even though you were upholding this giant facade, you never had a moment to consider it because you just went on to the next thing. And yeah. for me personally, it is in those quiet moments in that downtime, like I suck at doing nothing. Like, <laughs> that, that's right. That's, <laughs> that you know this about me that's when my yep. head gets me in trouble and yep. and you know learning that about yourself like I know I'm doing really well and you know the people around me my wife my mother you guys know like 
like if you called me and you said hey mark what did you do today and you're like i was like you know i just sat and looked out the window for an hour you'd be like troubles oh. on the horizon yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yep. you're like yeah or wait, struggles on the horizon or like if i said yeah i stared out the window today for an hour and you know what i feel great you'd be like yeah. oh oh so you're doing really yeah. well you know yeah. so it's this like dichotomy of like how you manage it and that's and i think that's one of the things you know when we think about this idea of thriving versus surviving is it shows up and it manages itself and manifests in different ways as things are going on and what we do and how we do it. Exactly. And I think you bring up a, a key point, which is as people find their voice, um, I think one of the biggest things about finding your voice is you finally begin to feel comfortable getting a support network around you. Um, And, and so when I think about, you know, my support network, obviously, you know, it started with, with Amy, um, who, you know, you and I obviously joke about our, our wives, um, and, and for some reason why they, they continue to, to stay with us, mine after, gosh, um, you know, it's going to be probably 29 years that we've been together now, uh, since college, but, um, you know, it's, it started with, you know, Amy, and then I slowly allowed that network to open up to, you know, it was Amy's family and, and it became a couple of really close friends of mine in New York. Um, And it allowed me to know that if I wasn't feeling well, I had somebody to turn to, but I also let them know like, hey, here are some of the warning signs, here are some of the triggers. And if you see them, um, I want you to speak up. Um, And I think in some ways that that's why, for me, I've become so public about this um, is, is one, I know how important it is for people to have that support work, support network around them. Um, but also I know for me, the more people that I know know about me and my struggles, um, the, the safer, if, if that's the right word, and more comfortable I feel. Um, like you were saying, like, I mean, you know, you've seen it. Um, you've seen me when I've had, when I've had bad days or bad, bad periods, um, you can either see it, you can hear it, you get a sense. Um, so I think it's, I think it's really important, um, when you're thinking about like, all right, what are those, you know, what are those next steps? Um, it's finding that support network around you, um, to be able to, you know, either have them admit or you admit to yourself, Hey, you know what? I'm not okay today. Um, and that person goes, yeah. It's totally fine. It's okay. What's going on? Yeah. Um, well, and and I think the important part of it too, especially when we think about when when mental illness moves from this into crisis, like it's very important that we have people around us who can not only be there to support us immediately, but also like check back in, like, hey, you know, did you call your therapist? Did you stop taking your meds? Like, what? Like, what's <laughs> yep. you know? <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Or, or maybe and, you should and, take another one. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> which you have said to me. Uh, and, yes. and I think on subsequent podcasts, I do have funny stories of when I've actually over-medicated myself. Uh, but there, are, um, you know, when you, when you talk about being in crisis, I think one of the things that I've, I've realized, and I don't know if you have, it'd be interesting to, to hear, but, you know, I think the last person to ever realize that you're in crisis is yourself. Um, by the time you bottom out, and I and I and when I think about the time, the 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 two times that I've really considered myself to have bottomed out, um, you know, Amy has recognized it before I have. Um, and even now, when you know, when I'm having some off days or things aren't going so well, um, you know, whether it's Amy checking in on me or, you know, every day she kind of will ask me, which I'm, I'm super thankful for. Hey, how are you doing today? Um, or other people, it may be sometimes one or two days or sometimes maybe even a week before I've actually had a, a chance to look back and reflect and been like, yeah, yeah, maybe I wasn't so, so great. Um, but having those people around me to ask me um, is usually what sort of prompts it at some point for me to, to, take a second and say, yeah, there's something going on. It's interesting. It brings up two thoughts for me. The first thought is, is my experience is very similar, except because of how my brain works, I knew something was up, but I'm crazy enough. And I will say that. (laughs) I got this. Like that's, that's how my mind works. 
right? Like you're at a different place in your life where you're literally like, no, I don't have this. Like I need the medication. I need people checking in, you know? So you're a little bit more on that side of it where yep. generally, and I can tell you two years ago when I went back into therapy, like I, I knew I wasn't right, but I was like, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And people around me, including you, my wife, my boss, who I so thankful to all of you for supporting me in that. We're like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. And it's like, no, yeah. no, dude, you're not. You're not yes, good, I, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And then the second piece of it, and I think it's important from this normalization standpoint, is I find, uh, and it's something I'm beginning to learn about myself and people that I really connect with, is in our society, it's very much okay and sort of accepted to be like, hey, how you doing? But you're not actually asking the question right? It's more of a exactly. And exactly. for me, when I, the people that I care about, when I ask them how they're doing, I'm asking. And yep. I think it's important for us to tell each other that, you know, like, no matter who it is in your life, even when you love and care for them, and you know, you're like, hey, how you doing? And they're like, yeah, I'm good. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, really, I'm asking. And, and yep. honestly, and if the answer is no, man, I'm good. Like, that's great. But then they know, and the people around you know, that you're actually asking them truly where they are, their body's good, their minds are good, like, are they feeling whole or do they need something, you know? And that, that's something, I know we can't hug right now, but it could be a high <laughs> five, an elbow yeah. slap, a hug. Yeah. Luckily, most of us have someone in our pod, but I mean, one of the reasons why I think you and I are so hell-bent at bringing this on right now is there are a lot of people that don't have their network, they don't have physical touch, they don't have the things that allow them to root themselves in their health. And that scares the shit out of both of us, truly. And oh, absolutely. that's why we're doing this. Well, and it's funny, you know, and I think as, as people get to know us better and better, uh, you know, we, we joke, I know your mom talks about it, like we're, we're brothers, you know, from another mother. Um, and it's true, like what you just brought up was something it was a conversation I had with a mutual friend of ours last night um, who lives here, didn't grow up in this country. Uh, and he actually said to me on the phone, he's like, you know, one of the things I really notice about the U S is people are not really, when they, when they say to each other, like, Hey, how you doing? Um, the response is usually, Oh, I'm great. Um, or when they ask it, it's just, they're asking it to be courteous, I guess. Um, he's like, it's just a greeting. It's just a greeting. And, and it's, it, it's as easy as somebody just saying hi and walking yep. away. Um, and he's like, where I come from, when we ask somebody, how are you doing? Like, we want to go out for coffee. We want to actually hear what's going on. Um, we, we truly feel a sense of like belonging to that other person. Um, and I think that's a lot about like what you and I are trying to do here. All right. It's, it's like, yeah, there's a greeting at the beginning of the podcast. Like, Hey, how you doing? Like, yeah. And that's how we greet each other. But um, yeah, maybe I'm not doing great. Um, and that's cool. Like, Hey, <laughs> I really want to know, like, how are you today? What's bothering you today? Um, and if you really are feeling great, then say why you're feeling great. Like, hey, I'm having a really good day because guess what happened to me? It's like when yeah. you and I text each other throughout the day, like, oh, my God, I can't believe X, Y, and Z is happening, right? Um, whether it be good or bad. Um, and, and I think, like you said, we have that with, with our network. Um, and we're also able through those texts or quick conversations to be able to pick up on, you know, wait a second, Mark's not, yeah, no, no, no. Something's not adding up. Like what he just texted me is kind of a veiled way of him saying like, hey, I need to talk later about X, Y, and Z. Um, so yeah, super, super insightful to have brought up that. Well, point. and actually, you know, and it's funny because you start to learn that stuff about yourself. Like for me, it's generally silence. Like if you don't hear anything, like if this loud mouth isn't <laughs> open, you know, yeah. and my wife says it better than anyone. She'll tell people all the time. She'll be like, if he's quiet, watch out. <laughs> yeah. 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 I always like to tell people, it's kind of funny. People are always like, Oh, you and Mark are like the same. Blah, blah. And, um, and, and, and I always say, yeah, well, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of a like slightly smaller, quieter <laughs> version of Mark, but I'm like, here's the thing about Mark. Like uh, you want it's to true. Mark? When you get really quiet, it's, it's yeah. It's and time it's, to, to check in. Yeah. Cause it's generally, I I'm not able to process what's going on, you know, like, you know, that's, and, 
and it's important, I think, in all of us and all of our stories and all the things that we go through is, you know, you bring up this idea of the network. And one of the things yeah. that I started to reflect on is it's not only that they check in and let you know, they're also sort of a mirror, right? Like you have those interactions and like all of a sudden you're like, wait, why did I react like that? Like that, that shouldn't upset me. That shouldn't make me yeah. angry or concerned or, you know, what, and you're like, wait, you know, is there something else going on? Is there something underlying? And I think, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it's sort of difficult to sort of tease through, but you know, one of the things that I use as a metaphor in my own mind is like, if you have pain somewhere, you know, we talked about, like I joked about the ankle earlier or, yeah. you know, you bust a finger or whatever, everything else kind of goes away because you're focused so much on that part of your body that hurts. And when, when the brain isn't operating the way you need it to, you know, all that other stuff kind of goes away. And especially for someone like me, like I am admittedly, insanely cerebral and think I can figure anything out. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, like the processor gets a little fried and I'm, I'm not okay. It doesn't work well for me. I don't really know how to process that. And yeah. Um, yeah. And, and look, I'm not, I'm not a mental health professional. Neither one of us are. Neither one of not, us not, are. Not, neither, neither one of us is. Um, I, I have spent enough time uh, and money over <laughs> Over the years, sitting in front of uh, licensed professionals that uh, I feel like I should almost have a degree. Uh, but I will I will say to that point, um, you know, it's it's the trigger that sets us off, but it's not the trigger that's the underlying issue. Um, and, it's, right. and it's been very <laughs> interesting to me over the years to realize like, hey, wait a second, like that what just happened is such a minor little blip on the radar. Like, I can't believe I just reacted like that. Um, and as you know, with me, it's usually like, I can be snarky and sarcastic, uh, but I can also take it to a next level where even you or someone else will go, uh, yeah, you probably shouldn't have just said that. Um, too far, too far. You've gone too far, right? <laughs> um, and so the trigger itself wasn't, right? That was just the, the tipping point. Um, but there's something else. And that's when you have to kind of sit back and recognize, all right, like what's really going on here. Um, and that's where that support network comes in really handy. Is well, to be able and, to talk. and, and to kind of wrap up, you know, wrap this up a little bit, put a bow on it. I think what you and I are trying to offer as not mental health professionals, <laughs> but people who've learned, you know, have been both like survivors and thrivers in this environment is, you know, we essentially are trying to create a virtual network for this. We, we want to show people the path of how we went through it. And we're going to share a lot of other people's stories to try to give different contexts. And, and, and really, if we can just help people, I like how you use the term, find their voice in this. And I, I find the term of like, you know, take the path of the, or the journey towards better mental well-being. And there's this sense of, you know, we're essentially trying to build a community uh, to support us all, including ourselves, because we've seen mm -hmm. we've seen the power in that, and and that's truly what we're trying to offer here. You know, we surviving is great, but it's not as great as thriving. No, um, and it, you know, I was thinking a lot this morning um, about you know how you and I started talking about this over the years, um, and we share a very close mutual friend who I know will be listening to this, um, and I remember the three of us. Um, heading up to Aspen Mountain one morning um, and having a conversation very similar to what you and I are having right now. Um, and he looked at us and he goes, yeah, guys, just own you're crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, and, but that's, it's kind of like growing that club, right? Like it's, it, but, but it's a club that's not an exclusive club. Um, and I think that's what's so important about this is we all, we all have our struggles and we're all trying to find our way. Um, and we're all trying to find our voice in different ways. Uh, and, and I know for me, it's, it's great to know that there are other people out there um, who may be experiencing similar things that I can talk to and I can associate with. And, um, and even just to kind of hear their story and go, wow, I thought I was the only one. Wow, that even if it just makes somebody feel a little bit better um, to know that they're not alone in this. Um, you know, that's what this is all about. 
Absolutely. And with that, Eric, I'm going to thank you so much for joining uh, me and us today. Uh, it's sort of odd because it'll be us together. <laughs> going forward. That's right. Um, but um, so this is Mark Fernandes in Snowmass Village, Eric DeRosa across the creek in Snowmass across Village. Across the creek. Well. And uh, please continue to join us. We're hoping to get these out twice a month. And we're going to be bringing a bunch of guests and other people who have in a similar journey to ours moved from survivor to thriver. Any last words, Eric? Uh, thank you all for listening today. And I look forward to uh, being on the other side of the, of the microphone in the uh, weeks and months to come. So thank Absolutely. You, and, uh, and I'm going to pay homage to your lovely wife um, from my <laughs> old podcast, a sign off that she really liked. And I hope I'm getting it right, but I'm going to invite everyone to be as well as you can. Yes. 